So our project is, um, well, in the team of the colloquium, Household Heterogeneity and Policy Relevance, um, what we do in this paper is zooming in on potential heterogeneous effects of housing sector specific tools, so my credential tools, on house price dynamics within um, local markets, so at the level of Belgian municipalities. And uh, the main research focus that we have in this paper is um, whether, so we want to find out whether there are heterogeneous effects associated with these national macro-credential tools, so the tools that the National Bank of Belgium imposes on the real asset sector within Belgium. So we ask whether and to which extent these national Belgian housing-specific macro-credential policy tools have heterogeneous effects on these local housing markets and more specifically on uh, house price dynamics. So, and we do this in a way that we control for local drivers of house price changes, where we also focus, so in terms of what can drive such heterogeneous effects, we focus on two things. First of all, housing market characteristics, so local housing market uh, characteristics being the hotness of a local market and also the extent of private mortgage indebtedness within this local market, so within this municipality. And second, we relate or try to relate these effects of the macroprudential tools to housing uh, financing constraints at the level of households. So that's the, the two main uh, types of heterogeneities that we have in mind when we want to explore those effects. The main motivation for this research question is being driven by the fact that if one looks at the aggregate effects of those macroprudential tools, which are specifically targeting, targeting the housing market, that the evidence of the effects on house price changes is mixed. And we think that this could be blurred, or the reason of this mixed evidence could be because uh, heterogeneous underlying effects, underlying impacts of these tools might be blurring those aggregate effects. Um, and we also, uh, so we want to focus on that, given that there haven't been that many papers focusing on these heterogeneous effects. And at the same time, it's also very policy relevant for policymakers that are being confronted with um, divergence in local housing markets, um, hotness or uh, divergent dynamics within these local housing markets. So we know that since the global financial crisis, these macroprudential authorities have been using these macroprudential tools. And macroprudential policy is mainly directed at trying to reduce the sensitivity of the financial system to shocks. To also to curb the emergent or to, to limit the emergent of systemic risk and to limit the sensitivity of financial distress by economic activity. So to, to limit the sensitivity of economic activity to financial distress occurring from uh, yeah, developments within the financial sector. So, and in terms of these, uh, so we know that the housing markets are a particular risk of, for financial stability, also for macroeconomic uh, instability. So, that is the reason why macroprudential policymakers also have specific tools which explicitly target these housing markets. And they have different tools at their disposal, where on the one hand you have um, uh, capital uh, requirements, uh, potentially in the form of risk rates for residential property loans at the banking sector, which makes that the resilience of banks towards house price busts, uh, for example, is being reduced. But they also have the so-called borrower-based tools at their disposal. And then you think about loan-to-value ratio limits, uh, limits on debt service to income, uh, debt to income, or possible combinations of these instruments. And those also have been employed in the end to lower the vulnerability of lenders to, um, yeah, financial, uh, to housing market bus, to housing market volatility. And where the main focus of macrodential authorities, and I guess also uh, the National Bank, is mainly on the effects that these tools have on this sensitivity of banks and financial institutions to this housing market um, volatility, we want to particularly focus on house prices and house price dynamics. Be, the reason for this is that apart from the indirect effect of these tools on um, the resilience of financial system to house price developments, 
these tools are also considered to affect uh, household financing. And we know that household financing conditions are a main driver of house price changes. So we want to uh, focus on these effects on house prices as uh, has already been examined in other uh, work in academia and uh, policy as well. So what do we want to, want to do? So we want to specifically take into account that housing markets have um, a local character, meaning that they are driven by a wide variety of demand and supply factors which uh, tend to vary at the local level. So house price changes are mainly local in nature rather than national. So this is important to take into account. Housing markets are really segmented and we cannot speak about a certain national housing market. Um, and in addition, we also know that these macroprudential instruments are mainly targeting the high-risk borrowers within these um, economies. And these might be specifically active in certain segments of the housing market. So also there you see that there is kind of a certain heterogeneity in uh, the part of housing markets which is the most relevant for these policymakers. So in this work, we focus on data at the municipality level. So we want to take into account this sizable local variation, so the regional variation in house prices, where we then at the same time can also focus explicitly on any regional heterogeneity that is um, potentially being driven by macroprudential policy tools at the national level. So, and just uh, for a reminder, so what is the Belgian experience with the use of these housing sector specific tools? Uh, well, uh, in the recent past, the National Bank of Belgium has introduced three measures. The first one in the end of 2013, which was um, the uh, imposition of a uh, risk rate on residential property loans for those banks which use internal rating based models. Uh, this was a flat uh, add-on, a 5% add-on on these risk rates uh, in order to, to try to reduce the, uh, the, uh, re the um, sensitivity to the high-risk segment in the real asset market in Belgium. Um, in end April 2018, this um, risk rate was um, replaced by a more stringent measure, namely um, not only the 5% flat add-on we had before, which is the channel component, but also an additional targeted component, which is based on microprudential risk rates uh, multiplied by a factor of 1.33. So this was really targeting the um, sensitivity to high risk loans, which was considered to be too high at the time by the National Bank of Belgium. So there was a restrictive um, measure um, increasing these risk rates further. And then since January 2020, the NBB has also um, started his so-called prudential expectations. And these are then the borrower-based measures I've talked about before. Uh, so the National Bank of Belgium introduced limits on loan-to-value ratios on residential, um, uh, residential mortgage loans. Uh, alone, but also in combination with uh, debt-to-income or debt-service-to-income uh, limits. So that's then the, the third measure that the uh, NBB has undertaken. So what we are trying to do is find out to which extent that these national macroprudential measures had differential effects on local housing markets. So to do that, we first have to focus on the house price growth rates in these local markets, and we uh, measure house price growth rate in our paper by making use of a hedonic price index, which has been constructed by uh, Peter Rusens and Coatra, so in an NBB research paper. And um, while I don't want to elaborate on a lot of technical details associated with this hedonic house price index construction, I do want to pinpoint here that it's uh, really relevant that we use a hedonic house price index because it allows us to take uh, or to pick up compositional effects in the properties that are being sold at the level of the municipalities in Belgium. So what does it mean? It allows us based on a variety of housing characteristics to measure house price changes for a typical dwelling at a time. So we take into account with this hedonic price index that the pool of houses being sold at one period at in time for one municipality can change quite drastically from, from year to year, from quarter to quarter. 
And this reduces the volatility in house price uh, growth rates considerably relative to just using average transaction prices because especially in smaller municipalities, these house price uh, changes can be very volatile, can be, um, yeah, they can get quite extreme values and we want to avoid uh, those extreme values to be driven by the composition of the houses being sold in a particular period. And what you then see in these figures is just an I think it's fairly small, so I hope that it's still clear. But uh, what you can see is that for, um, in the end, we come to a sample of almost 500 municipalities so of the 581 municipalities we have today, because we do some cleaning here and there. Um, and we get to a, house uh, a measure of house price changes, which seems to incorporate quite some um, cross-sectional variation apart from the time variation of these house price growth rates within a particular municipality. And uh, here I show you figures for, so we have a sample running from 2012 to 2020, and here I show you the uh, evolution or the uh, distribution of these house price growth rates for three years within this sample. So for the first year, 2012, uh, for 2000, um, so for, uh, oh sorry, so for 2016, <laughs> this doesn't work. Okay, I'll just leave it for 2016, but also for 2020, so the last year of our sample. And um, so what I wanted to spot or highlight is this, um, if you look at the Belgian coastal region, and I'll do one, no. So if you look at the Belgian coastal region, so on the upper part you have the municipality of Knokke Heest, uh, which is in 2012, um, it's depicted in red, and red means that it's in the first quantile of the distribution of house price growth rates. Whereas if you would look at the second uh, year that we show here, which is uh, 2016, there you see that it's in orange. Uh, meaning that this growth rate for Knokke Heest has been uh, changed from the first quantile of the house price distribution to the second quantile. So it actually changed from an, um, a growth rate of minus 3.5% to 0.5%. And then in the last year, so meaning 2020, you see that this has become green. That's the highest quantile of our house price distribution for that period. So this, meaning, this means that the at the time, 70% increase in Knokke Hees and house price growth rate is then being in the upper part of the distribution of these cross-sections over time. So there seems to be quite some um, variation in uh, terms of the ranking of these different municipalities in the entire uh, overview of municipalities over the years. And this makes that we have quite some variation in these local housing markets to explore in our analysis. So what I'm showing you here is our measure of this macroprudential policy index because we do want to um, measure how macroprudential tools oriented or targeting uh, these housing markets have an effect on these house price growth rates. So we have to measure um, macroprudential policies. And uh, we do this based on a very standard indicator in this literature, which uses a dummy approach. A dummy approach, which is equal mi e e either minus one, zero, or plus one, where minus one means that there is a loosening of macroprudential action, zero is that there is no change, and one is that there is a uh, tightening of macroprudential policy. So in this graph, you do notice that our y-axis only runs from zero to one. The reason is that um, up to today, there only have been tightenings in these prudential tools. So we only focus here on the positive segment. So as I said before, the National Bank of Belgium introduced multiple uh, tools, uh, namely um, the risk weights, which are depicted in green, where we had a change in end 2013 and a change in 2018. And then we also had these um, prudential expectations related to the LTV ratio and combinations of the LTV ratio and debt to income or debt service to income ratios, which are depicted here in blue and red. And just to be clear, like for the econometric um, analysis, and 
Yes, thank you. Um, we do take changes in the macroprudential index. So what I've shown you before was the level of cumulative macroprudential policy index and what we use in our econometric analysis are the changes in this uh, indicator where you see that we uh, have an, um, a tightening in 2000. Um, and 2013, in 2018, and furthermore, an increase in 2020. Now, what is different in our approach relative to the standard dummy approach is that we take into account the intensity of the tightenings or the intensity of the macroprudential change. Um, and the reason why we do this is because it's not only important to look at the direction of the change and the timing of the change, but you also want to control for the fact how binding this change actually is. And so we do this based on a, a number of indicators of which, on which I will not elaborate now, but that's uh, something we add to this, uh, to this field. Okay. Yes, so this brings me to our first uh, model specification. So in this paper, we actually use two different econometric approaches. And this one is the first, namely a da dynamic panel data regression, where as a dependent vari variable, we have house price growth rates at the municipality level. So YIRT is house price uh, growth in municipality I, in region R, because we have three regions in Belgium, and we want to pick up, uh, this up as well, and then at time period T. So these house price growth rates are regressed on a leg, and then an, um, a vector of explanatory variables, which meaning local driver of local house price growth rates. Um, then we have the interaction term, and that's really the focus of our interest, this beta estimates, uh, capturing the um, changes in the macroprudential index interacted with indicators that are linked to uh, these uh, housing market characteristics at the local level and also the, um, the, um, the amount of um, high-risk uh, residents in these municipalities. But I'll come back to that later. We add um, municipality fixed effects and time fixed effects, but apart from that, also a time times region fixed effect because we want to pick up any time varying effects of changes at the regional level, uh, for example, tax deduction subsidies. Okay, so we have a yearly data set of running from 2012 till 2020, and we cover about 500 municipalities. So, what does this X factor contain? Well, it contains local house price growth rate drivers, so meaning that we capture several demand and supply side determinants at the local level, being a median per capita income, employment growth, the number of households versus the number of uh, inhabitants, and also supply determinant based on the number of um, dwellings related to the number of inhabitants. Of more uh, particular interest here today is this interaction term. So what does it contain? Well, it contains these different characteristics which we will analyze in terms of heterogeneity of these macroprudential effects. So first of all, it contains a measure of um, the extent that uh, the extent of uh, financially constrained or high-risk borrowers at the municipality level. And uh, we use predetermined variables for that in order to minimize any reverse causality problems. So we use the share of low income inhabitants, the share of overdue credits, the share of young people, single person households and single parent households because those are associated to representing high risk borrowers. They are indicators of high risk borrowers and also financially constrained borrowers, potentially at least. The share of young people is also included because within um, of the share of highly educated young people is part of the share of young people, but for them we expect them to be less financially constrained. So there you would expect an opposite um, change, uh, an opposite sign of this beta coefficient. The second indicator we use is the hotness indicator, so capturing how active these housing markets are. The reason is that um, related literature on this heterogeneous effect has found that macroprudential policy tools are um, more effective or more uh, dampening, they have more dampening effects on house prices whenever a local housing market is hot. And in addition, we also use um, the 
uh, growth rate in household indebtedness, so taking a number of mortgage credits relative to total credit, um, to capture the perceived riskiness of this local housing market. So taking into account the fact that the more mortgage credits there are, the more uh, risky this uh, local housing market might be. And this brings me to the yeah. This brings me to the first set of results. So if we um, estimate this, this baseline model and we add this interaction uh, one by one, we do see that we find significantly negative coefficients, so beta coefficients of these financially the, these indicators of financially constrained residents. So this means that if you have a tightening macroprudential policy, that the downward effect on house price dynamics is larger for this group of municipalities, so for those municipalities with the larger share of such high-risk residents. What we don't see, however, is an, well, we do see a negative coefficient for um, the hotness of, our, of the housing market, our variable that we use here, but it's not significant. So there, there doesn't seem to be a significant sign according to these results. And we also see that the effects of household indebtedness or the growth rate in household indebtedness does not affect the, um, the, the, as the impact of macroprudential measures on house price growth rate. So one explanation for the latter could be that we just have uh, a measure of the extensive margin of household indebtedness relative to the intensity, and it might not be able to capture the, um, the growth in risky debt positions. So if we then combine these different interactions, then we, bear, we more or less have very robust results. So in column one, we combine the uh, characteristics of the local housing market, being the hotness of the housing market and the amount of household indebtedness. In column two, we combine the highly educated young people together with the young people. And in three, we um, combine all the interactions related to financially constrained residents, except for highly educated young people and the amount of overdue credit, because those are uh, really correlated with low-income households. So the correlation is too high, and we uh, decided just to uh, show these results. So we can see that these coefficients of low-income households and young people remain significantly negative, so they are robust to including these interaction terms together, but we do see some changes in the significance of single-person households and single-parent uh, households, which don't seem to hold, and even uh, the single-person group even switches sign. When we take a look at the effect of the highly educated young people in column two, there we see indeed that those young people who are considered to be less constrained because of their high level of education seem to um, have an opposite effect relative to the initial dampening effect, um, so the, the additional dampening effect of macroprudential policy for municipalities uh, with a high share of young people. So the second econometric model that we use is a quanta regression problem, uh, not problem, but uh, <laughs> methods. Um, and what we want to do here is to have an alternative way of measuring the impact of um, the hotness of the housing market. And we do this by making use of this quanta regression method because what we can do with this, uh, with this approach is that we can make these coefficients vary according to the percentile of the, uh, the percentile distribution of the dependent variable, which is in our, uh, in our case house price growth rates. So these beta coefficients in particular are allowed to vary according to the percentile of the distribution of house price growth rate for our group of municipalities at each point in time. So why is this important? Well, if we look at uh, the left tail of the distribution, so those municipalities confronted with very low house price growth rates, that we consider to be cold housing markets. If we look at the right tail of the distribution, the, so the municipalities with high growth rates of house prices, those are then considered to be hot housing markets. And uh, this measure uh, of um, looking at these price changes to come to a measure of the hotness of the uh, local house price 
um, the local housing market is based on work of uh, Agaria et al, but it allows us here to have much more flexibility because all our coefficients can vary according to the hotness of the housing market. So not only these beta estimates, but also all the other coefficient estimates in our model. And this by means of this subscript tau, which is um, in our case reflecting each decile of this distribution. So if we then take, yeah, and I only have one minute, so I will skip this slide. If we then take a look at the results of the combined interaction terms, we actually see that our previous results for the effects of the share of low-income people are very robust in the sense that there's a negative coefficient. But moreover, we see that if we move on the x-axis from cold to hot housing markets, that these effects become more, um, more important. And the same holds for the share of young people. So going to my conclusion, well, we wanted to analyze whether house price changes are heter heterogeneously impacted by national macroprudential policies, and we do find evidence for geographic heterogeneity uh, depending on the residents. So macroprudential tightenings have stronger dampening effects on house price growth rate in local housing markets when, you are co when these municipalities are characterized by more constrained residents. So meaning low-income people and young people in particular. Next to that, but then only with the quantile regression approach, we do find that these effects tend to be even more explicit in hot housing markets relative to cold housing markets. So why does it matter? Well, it means that if macroprudential policy is using such type of tools, that it can be an adequate tool to stabilize local housing markets because the effects on those hot housing markets are larger with the tightening relative to the cold housing markets. So this is really relevant information for policymakers, but this comes with an important caveat in the sense that what we find is that these effects in hot housing markets are especially strong for low-income people and for young people, but this might also be driven by the fact that those potential borrowers are being pushed out of the market. And that's, of course, uh, it, that has distributional consequences of which policymakers want to, um, well, they want to take a look at that for sure. So, and I want to end my presentation with just referring to um, some future possibilities in this, this type of work, namely that we really need more granular data, some individual micro-level data that combine information of borrower characteristic, house price character, housing characteristic, as well as mortgage credit characteristics, because this would allow us to make an even more granular analysis. Thank you.